World War One. Um, uh, I'll cover a brief uh, description of, of exactly how we did this through the research and methods. Uh, go over some innovations on the Western Front that uh, sort of pop out at us, and then uh, do some insights of the Italian Front. And then my esteemed colleague uh, Steve Sutterby will go into some more details on uh, the Western Front. So let me ask a question up front here, which is, what if you could know when and where every bomb was dropped over the last hundred years or a hundred years ago? What would you know if you could look at that kind of information? And that's kind of the question I asked myself as I sort of began digging into the, into the data to see what can we know. Um, this was driven in part because I was at the air staff at the time, and we weren't sure where we had dropped bombs a week ago over Iraq or Afghanistan. I kept having to go find those answers, and we, I said, well, where's the database where all this information is? And it turns out we didn't have one. Uh, so I began building one, and as I built it, I started asking the question, well, how far back could we go on this? And it turns out you can actually go back all the way to World War I because the mission reports filled out by pilots are pretty much the same over the last hundred years. They've been reinvented for every war, but they all contain the same information because the same questions keep getting asked by, this, by different generals in each generation. Um, I'll just jump ahead here so you can see the, this is the World War I mission report uh, covering the, uh, the five W's and the one H there. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, varies in terms of format. This is how all that breaks out, uh, so it's a little bit ugly if you try to read it this way. But if you parse all those pieces out, you can put them into an Excel spreadsheet, enter it into a database, and you can end up uh, with a comprehensive uh, information of what is going on about those missions. And you can go back and look to see how that mission was uh, performed, when it was performed, when the bombs dropped, and uh, you can start drawing some insights from those. As I mentioned, we've reinvented the wheel on this. The, uh, this is the uh, various uh, studies that have been done after each war and the, and the uh, data we've collected for it. You know, folks have, have said that the air power didn't do much, it did reconnaissance, it did some air to air, but the bombing really didn't have that much of an impact on World War I. I, I think it's interesting, there's 17,000 sorties we've been able to recover so far in terms of mission reports, uh, and I think we'll show you that, there's, that may not be actually a true opinion of how the, uh, the bombing went. Uh, World War II, we've been able to recover about a million sorties from that and uh, the missions flown there. Korea, about 165,000, mostly of the uh, B-29 missions, and then uh, Vietnam, uh, 13 and a half million um, sorties being flown there. How the data gets into uh, the database, uh, we start off with the, uh, the sortie uh, flies the mission to fill out their daily uh, raid report. Uh, Colonel Gorell uh, in 1918 compiled all that into a 260 volume uh, report. I think there's only two copies of that printed, one still at the um, Library of Congress, the other ones are all on microfilm because nobody wants to have 260 volumes uh, in their library. Uh, so that microfilm was sitting around for the last uh, 70, 80 years. We had it uh, scanned and then we uh, hand typed it into Excel, put it into the database, and then we can then use it in uh, modern uh, geospatial information system software and we can start to have some real fun with it uh, in terms of visualization. Along the lines of finding these mission reports, I came across some other items uh, in the, I was digging around in the back of the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell. I, got, I was lucky enough to have a, a backstage pass so the whole uh, history of the Air Force was open to me. I could open any box and dig through it and find whatever documents I wanted. And in the course of one unlisted file from 1918 that just had bombing information in it, there were these photographs of what I call scribble maps. At first I was trying to figure out who is trying to deface these uh, these maps and why are they trying to you know, eradicate what's on there. Upon further examination, it turns out these are from the 91st Aero Squadron, the Reconnaissance Squadron, and these are the ground traces. Uh, St. Mihail before and during the conflict right here, and then this is the Argonne Meuse area immediately thereafter. And I, after, after scanning these in and looking in more detail, I found out they're not just uh, nice little ground traces that sort of tell you kind of where they were at, they're actual map overlays. And if you scale them and put them on Google Earth, they actually overlay quite nicely and show you where the front line was. And you can see how deep we're uh, searching with the uh, air reconnaissance and also you know, how heavily are they saturating areas with uh, overflights to look to see uh, what's going on and what kind of movements the Germans are doing in that time period. So this covers 86 miles of the front from August on the, on the right to uh, October 1st on the left to give you a sense of idea. So that's, I think it's kind of fascinating, 100 years after the fact, we can see where the reconnaissance points are flying, the ground traces, 
that they're doing here are no different than what we do today with computer software tracking the GPS track of the planes over the battlefield, invented 100 years ago, still active today just with higher tech uh, resources. Another thing I found in that same bomber material folder was this lovely map. It's a French planning map of the Meuse Argonne campaign. This is about the size of these blueprints you have on the tables here. Uh, this was given to us by the, uh, the French in um, August 18th, 1918. Had a little note attached to it going, uh, you know, attention, Colonel Lom, ur most urgent, please review. <coughs> and then attached with the map were also three pages of explaining how these blue areas, which are where the French want us to bomb, um, why those targets are important, what's there, and then the timing of when those would be hit on what given day based on how well the ground forces were making their advance. So if the ground forces were going well, artillery would take care of them. If ground forces were stalled out, uh, the airplanes would then uh, attack them in a certain sequence. Uh, it's a beautiful head trim map. I don't know if it shows up as well on the map on the uh, screen here. But you can see these are little individual trees. You can see along the roads there are, uh, there are trees along the roads. Um, and it actually lines up with the Google Earth photos of the trees along the roads today. There's individual buildings for the, for the uh, villages. And you can see the lines, and when you look at them going, why are they squiggly? It turns out uh, that's because when you lay it out on Google Earth and you uh, do the 3D exaggeration a little bit so you can see the hills, it means those are constant altitude lines. So those are the trenches are at a constant uh, level line across all those hills. A, uh, accompanying all the uh, maps and, and the scribble maps, I also was blessed with some lovely aerial photographs. This is uh, the town of Conflans, a major rail hub here, the major uh, rail yard over here, the, the roundhouse, um, and then the, the town here of, of Conflans. You've had uh, a Red Cross station up here, and another one, if I can see the name of the map here, is down in this region. Um, you can see there's two, there's one's got a uh, circular Red Cross, and over down here is a square Red Cross. Um, a couple things of interest on this map. Uh, one, you can also see that there are craters uh, in the rail yard here, and, and those actually uh, line up well with the uh, missions that have their mission reports for saying we bombed the eastern end of the uh, rail yards on the 15th, and this is taken on the 16th, and you can see there's actually what look like fresh craters up there on, on the uh, east side of the yards. I do want to point out this roundhouse was a major target of the Allies, because the Confluence was a major rail station of, of shipping things to the front. and. It, I thought when I first did this that it was out of range of all um, ground artillery. It turns out there actually was an American battery of artillery um, that uh, claimed that they actually hit the roundhouse and, and completely demolished it on the 13th uh, of September, which is three days prior to this photo being taken. So I don't want to accuse anybody in the artillery branch of not being accurate. I want to <laughs> I want to thank or acknowledge the incredible workmanship of the German engineers to rebuild that roof <laughs> in less than 72 hours. And I mean, there's a speck of damage still showing on that. So um, I've always been amazed at how the artillery can tell they've got a direct hit when they can't see the target. But when a when a pilot over the target hits the target, they want a photograph to prove that we did it. Um, one of those things. Uh, the reason I point out the Red Cross is up here, and, I, and in the end I can't see, I think I've overlapped it, but down this region, is uh, one of the days they were doing the bombing missions, they were trying to hit the rail line, which goes right by the uh, Red Cross station up here, and the wind uh, knocked the bombs off target, and they drifted, and at least one of the bombs actually hit the tent, um, and the pilot was reporting this with much chagrin that he hit the Red Cross tent. Uh, he wasn't so upset that he hit the, the tent so much as the secondary explosions going off from the armaments that were underneath that tent uh, actually hit <laughs> the other side of this plane. Uh, so obviously the Germans didn't quite understand, or maybe they understood too well, how the Red Cross was supposed to work. Um, and the last piece of, of information I'll show here is on the houses you see here in the main part of town, the, the center of the square of town, right about here, uh, the pilots of the 96th believe that was where the German commandant was staying, because when they tried to hit the rail yard, uh, they, again, the wind blew, the, they were trying to hit the roundhouse, the wind blew the bombs into the uh, area right next to the house here, hit the house, hit the yard. Uh, the next day there was a German fighter squad in there. So, um, you know, even misses have impacts. But uh, you can take this aerial photograph and you can actually uh, line up, thanks to the city squares, this is a present day Google Earth image, you can actually line it up uh, exactly and then you can actually geolocate all of these uh, craters so you can actually get down to 10 decimal places or whatever, however far you want to type over, um, the actual locations of where bombs dropped in World War I. This is uh, incredibly accurate compared to some of the information we have from the first Gulf War, where I only have a 10 by 15 square where A-10s were shooting tanks. I don't know any more details than that. 
but 100 years ago, I can tell you at uh, 10 decimal places where the bombs were hit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, some technology. Um, so that's what we've done. So that's what I've done to sort of try to tie all the information I have from over one into getting the mission report, tying it to the map, getting the location of the bombs dropping, um, and then we can actually go through and uh, combine all this and, and make sort of a new view of what World War One looks like. And so I'm going to show you a, a brief video covering World War One from 1914 to 1918, Western and Italian front. Uh, we've got French airstrikes in white, British in red, Italians in orange, and Americans in blue. And it'll go through a couple times here, so it'll give a little bit of a walkthrough. No, I have the yeah. Sorry, dramatic music and intro here. There's a little time, uh, you'll see a little clock up in the top here, counting the, the um, main, actually, main thing popped up. But anyway, so you start to see the French attacks here in white, and down here in 1915, you see the Italians. And then the, the British start with the red here. And this is a cumulative show, so this is just, you'll see them all pile on top of each other. There's the Americans in blue. And also over in Italy, we also have uh, Americans. Uh, this is a moving four month window, so every 120 days it's just sliding across. You need to feel the timing. This is the Italian front in uh, 1915 and 1918. Uh, the various battles of the Isozo are basically here, and this part of the mountains. You'll see the uh, the, the collapse of the uh, Italian front in 1917. Basically, charged down this way as the uh, the Germans and the Austrians use the or Germans teach the Austrians about the Hoodie tactics to uh, infiltrate, and uh, that's called the, the uh, Battle of Capretto. The Italians still use that as a, uh, a, a swear word. And then here we have the, uh, the breakout in 1918 for the Battle of Vittorio Benito, which I'll cover in a little bit more detail in a second here. So, that's kind of what the war looks like when you look at it from just a data perspective. I didn't line it up with any of the major battle lines or anything like that at that point, but um, one thing I want to point out, not those dots just aren't dots, they're actually data points. And uh, where I have the altitudes above uh, ground where they drop the bombs, we actually have them elevated, so you can actually see them sort of on little lollipop sticks of uh, where they are. And if you click on one of them, you get all the mission report details of that particular mission. So you can sort of walk through both in time and space, to see what the details of that mission were and what it was trying to accomplish. Um, since it's data, we can play with it and look at it in different ways. One of the ways we, we can do that is actually, you saw the, the movement of it over time. We can also take a look at it at intensity over time, what I call a heat map. Uh, I've got a few places over here which are uh, misplaced, my fault, when you're trying to match up all the various French town names. Uh, there's various names of Notre Dame. I think it's about 26 or 27 different uh, instantations of it. In, in the uh, French countryside, it's kind of like Springfield in America. Uh, so I've, I've got a couple of these that are a little bit off. I need to go back and re geolocate those. But uh, this is just the intensity of where the bombs were dropped in 1918, which is interesting in itself. 
But when you actually uh, include with it the, the, the battle lines of where the uh, battle was going on at the time, you start to see some very interesting correlations, uh, such as what's going on over here with the uh, Second Battle of the Marne, that, okay, where the maximum German uh, movement south is, you see there's all of a sudden a lot of in, in, uh, intensity there. I'm going to let uh, Steve talk about that in more detail. But uh, there's like I said, lots of interesting ways you can start to look at some intercorrelations that sort of ask that or challenge that question that the air power didn't do much in terms of bombing in World War I. Um, when you look at, I hadn't had the French data when I did this, but if you look at the British and American data in terms of the frequency of bombing and the intensity of bombing over time, you start to see something interesting as well, which is uh, we didn't start bombing as an, uh, uh, America didn't start bombing until about June of 1918. The British have been doing it uh, since 1917, but still not much of an intensity. And then in 90 days, uh, everything just changes and it just skyrockets. So I looked at this from a data perspective and went, well, that's odd. Something's changed. Why is that? Um, so I started digging into it. Again, this is sort of how I fall into it, you know, from data falling into a historian mode of how did this happen? Who made it possible? What, what was going on there? And it turns out that we have. Um, we have the birth of the American Air Force here in terms of its ability to actually bomb on foreign soil and to have an effect on the course of the war. And what it takes to make that happen, of course, is some key people. One, of course, is uh, you need a brilliant general. Um, and I, I, would, I would say that uh, you know, Billy Mitchell probably fits the mold of being a brilliant general. Uh, he came up with very simple ideas. Blind the enemy, keep them on the ground. Um, prevent them from being able to move around the battlefield, lock them down on their, on their uh, bases, keep them from being able to move forces back and forth, and attack from the west unexpectedly. The reason I think Billy Mitchell meets the requirement for being brilliant is that's not that we've not come up with uh, better strategies. I don't think we've come up with a different one in various campaigns. If you look at Normandy, it's the exact same strategy. Lock the enemy down, attack from the west unexpectedly. Incheon, Korea, let's see. Lock the enemy down, attack from the west unexpectedly. Desert Storm. Lock the enemy down, attack the West unexpectedly. I'll give Saddam this. In, in, uh, in OIF, he was waiting for us to attack from the West, and we attacked from the South. So <laughs> he, he did learn his lesson. I'll give him that. But it turns out you can't do the war alone with just a general writing a great plan. You also need what I refer to as the most important man in the history of the Air Force. It turns out it's a lieutenant. Uh, it's not any lieutenant. It's one very specific lieutenant. And no one I'd heard of him, at least in my little circle of friends, until I came and spoke in Dayton about this, and everybody in the audience goes, well, yes, of course it is, and John knows exactly who he's speaking of. And that's under Gundelach. Um, and then everybody usually says, at least everybody in uniform that I was telling this to was like, who's he? Uh, which is kind of sad that the Air Force has lost you know, the history of, one of what I consider the most important man in the Air Force. And that is because um, he comes from an interesting background. He was a sailor before he was an airman. So the Air Force was joint before we were in a separate service. Uh, he also flew with the French before he flew with the, uh, the U.S. Air, Air Corps. So we were coalition as well as joint before we were in our own service. Um, and he was an instructor. He taught all the American pilots uh, before they went to the front. And he joined the 96th Bomb uh, Squadron, or Bombing Squadron, uh, in May, right before they came to the front. And he died on the first day of St. Mihail. Um, so why is he important, especially if he dies so quickly? Well, it turns out he invented American bomber tactics. He invented the seven-plane uh, bombing formation. Uh, the French and the British had a 14-plane and 21-plane and 19-plane formations. Uh, those didn't work with the American planes we were flying, the, the Bouguet uh, uh, B-2s. They didn't work with us for two reasons. One, the blind spots when you have the planes in such a formation, they didn't work. Two, we had seven planes. So the seven-plane formation was kind of required because you couldn't do any more than that at the time. Um, but he arranged the planes so that they reinforced each other's fields of fire and, and had visibility so the squadron could maintain control of the uh, formation. He enforced formation flying. One of the things uh, written about him when he's telling this to the other members of the 96th was that when he flew with the French, 14 planes, 20 planes would take off. When he'd get over the target, there's only three planes there. Everybody else had left. So. The rule he instituted was, if you took off and you crossed the line, you were with the formation until we hit the target. If you, if, there's the only reason you could leave the formation is because the Germans shoot you out of the sky. Uh, there's, uh, there's a 1925 paper written for the War College by a, a, a 
student that interviewed members of the 96, and they told their story of uh, flying with Andre Gundula the first time over the line. They got a little nervous because the flak started flying up at them, and you know, the pilot, the observer, said, "We're just gonna, you know, ease back a little bit." And uh, they said Andre turned around at them. It, there's two versions of the story. One says the gunner turned his guns on them and they moved back in formation. The other is he just shook his fist at them and they were scared enough by that that they moved back in formation. Uh, he then flew them through the flak five or six times so that they lost their fear of the flak but they didn't lose their fear of him. <laughs> <laughs> These tactics are not recommended for today's Air Force, just so you know. Um, the other thing that they did was they coordinated their defensive firepower, which was kind of a, a, a new concept of the time, sort of. Which was the guns at the time, uh, you, um, experts here will, will no doubt know this, uh, the, the, the springs would sort of freeze up at altitude because you're flying at 14,000 feet, so you had to keep the guns warm, you had to fire off a couple of bursts every so often uh, to keep the guns uh, working so they could be ready to work when you needed them. Um, the 96 started off a little bit of uh, competition up there. They started shooting at clouds to see if they could all hit the same cloud. Uh, and then they started shooting at the flak uh, because it was a way of dealing with the fear of the flak shooting back at them, helped them feel better. Um, so that when they actually started encountering German fighters, they were already well trained for two months of doing this, that they could actually all have all seven planes aim at the nearest uh, German fighter coming at them, who's now getting hit from seven different directions. Uh, so uh, that was a, a, a major innovation. And then the last piece, which I thought was pretty interesting, is there was a lot of rain and uh, weather there in uh, the the uh, summer and fall of 1918, uh, days they were not flying were not idle days. Uh, they were practicing land navigation. And uh, one of the things that Andre had, being a school teacher he was, he would grab a hat and they would have to reach into a hat and pull out a square from a map, either a photographic map or a, a uh, drawn map, and they would have to identify where that uh, item was, what, what was the uh, square they were looking at. And then they would have to lay it down on the table and draw the eight squares around it because you would only have one little shot, possibly, of looking through a cloud. You had to know exactly where you were and be able to hit your target. Uh, you know, tens of miles to, uh, you know, 50, 60 miles away from where you took off. So you have to be able to navigate, even given poor visibility. And all this has paid off um, in their missions on uh, St. Mihail and afterwards. Uh, lastly, I say he taught his uh, fellow airmen to uh, think like wingmen, to uh, think about the mission, think about the, uh, the larger service versus just their own uh, pilotage. I usually get choked up when I read these, um, but I can try to get through at least one of these here for you. Uh, the day after uh, Andre died, uh, one of his uh, fellow airmen was awarded the uh, Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, the citation reads, the Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Stephen T. Hopkins, Second Lieutenant, uh, Air Service, U.S. Army, for exemplar, sorry, extraordinary heroism in action between, I'm going to butcher the French Air College, Chambly and Zoms, France, September 13, 1918 while acting as pilot of a flight of three airplanes, which were attacked by 15 enemy planes, Lieutenant Hopkins continued on his mission and bombed his objective despite the fact that he was surrounded by greatly superior numbers of the enemy. In the, in the fight which followed the bombing operations, Lieutenant Hopkins and his observer continued, to f f continued the flight until shot down and killed, thus enabling one aircraft of the flight to return to the aerodrome with valuable information. Their whole conduct and superb devotion up to duty of Lieutenant Hopkins proved to be an inspiration to the members of his squadron. Uh, there's more than uh, just these two, there's about seven or eight uh, that read much in a similar manner of uh, airmen giving their lives for their uh, compatriots so that they could make it back to base. Uh, one of my uh, favorites is the crew that actually has their engine uh, get hit with a piece of flak, so they, they're only operating off of two cylinders en route to the target. They stick with the squadron as best they can to get to the target. They drop their bombs on the target, and as they are turning back and falling back and losing altitude, as they're basically gliding uh, to the uh, friendly lines, uh, they are jumped by the whole squadron is jumped by German fighter aircraft, and uh, this crew continues firing at those aircraft all the way down to the ground. Uh, so he taught them to think like a team and operate like a team. You know, even after his death. And in fact, it's long after his death that this is still uh, an impact. He, uh, his legacy lived on. He, uh, the le the, what he trained his pilots to do went on to affect the other bombing squadrons, pilots from the 96, the 20th, the 11th, the 166, all carried on that same kind of standard he had set and brought it back uh, after the war and helped set up the ACTS school at Maxwell and utilized a lot of the lessons learned and a lot of the precepts he uh, developed to begin 
forming the core of the daylight precision bombing uh, uh, strategy that we developed for World War II. Interestingly enough, there were a few lessons that were not remembered. Uh, one, that enemy fighters will always attack the bombers. Uh, bombers need fighter escorts in a non-permissive environment. And uh, those were had to be relearned at, at great cost in World War II and also in Korea. So jumping gears a little bit, going into the insights from the Italian front, uh, I want to talk about the Americans on the Italian front versus just the Italians, partially because I'm still trying to compile the full Italian um, battle story. Italian, anybody here from Italy? Let's make sure. Okay, so the Italians are great with very descriptive language. They're crap with numbers. So I have lots of stories of many of our large squadrons, but I don't know how many planes that is. I don't know how many bombs it is that dropped on target, so I'm still trying to piece that together. Uh, the Americans filed their reports with the War Department exactly how many planes flew and hit which targets on which day, so I'm able to piece that part together. Um, but what I find interesting on the, on the, on the Battle of Vittorio Veneto, which is one of the last battles of, of uh, World War I on the Italian front, uh, for folks that aren't uh, familiar with this one, the, the, basically the, the Italians burst through the uh, Austro-Hungarian lines and they're able to make great progress and wrap up both ends of the Austro-Hungarian Austro lines, capture 300,000 plus uh, prisoners of war, some numbers go as high as 450,000. Uh, this is such an incredible shock to Austria-Hungary that uh, Hungary secedes from the Union, says we're done with you, um, and uh, sues for a separate peace, Austria sues for a separate peace, and uh, part of the conditions of that uh, separate peace uh, with the Allies is that the Allies will have right-of-way and uh, free passage on the Austrian-Hungarian um, rail lines to go all the way up to the uh, southern border of Germany. So they'll be able to start a second front on the southern end of Germany. Uh, this is at, occurring between August, or, pardon me, October 24th and October 29th, 1918. Um, and I, I believe the armistice with, with Austria was signed by November 3rd. So by you know, November 4th, they're already getting ready to move stuff on those rails. What I found interesting when I was looking at this is, OK, so the battle's over here. This is where we're breaking through the lines, and you see the Italians uh, bombing with dirigibles and, and Capronis. And, and there's also one more thing I should mention. The tactical versus strategic boundary for World War I is 14 miles. It's, uh, it's 25,000 yards. If it was beyond artillery range, it was strategic. If it was within artillery range, it was tactical. And so that, that little white circle here is that boundary between tactical and strategic. And so we have Americans in blue 30, 40, 50 miles beyond the tactical boundary of the battlefield. What are they doing out here? Uh, so when I click on those little blue dots and see the mission profiles, I find out they're actually hitting the uh, rail lines and the rail stations uh, at these locations. And over here, it's rail lines and bridges well beyond the, the battlefield. Uh, turns out they're actually they're doing strategic interdiction. I think this might be the first time, or amongst the first times this is being uh, documented, that we're actually preventing the reinforcements from getting to the front. So no men, no material, no bullets, no food, no water is making it to these uh, Austro-Hungarians Austri that are there at the front as the Italians are bursting through. So what you have here is a case of airplanes invisible to the front actually changing, I believe, the course of the battle. Because this, there's very few rail lines back here. There's only one thin line that goes through, and we've shut down all the stations on it. So if you think about it, that's a three-man crew on a Caproni, and there's one, two, three, four on this one. So that's about 12 guys, 12 Americans, that may have helped uh, bring about an end to World War I, uh, long before it was probably going to happen otherwise. Because as soon as uh, this is signed, the, the, uh, as soon as this, is, this collapses, Germany sues for peace a week later. So, you know, is it, is it uh, absolutely positively confirmed? No, not at this point, but I think it's indicative that air power may have had a bigger impact on World War I than has been given credit in the history books up to this point. So, uh, there is one more thing I'd like to point out, because this is data, and, and I like, like data. Um, I asked, what would you know if you could know where every bomb was dropped? It turns out you can also ask about the weather. And there's a, a little thing called the uh, 20th Century Reanalysis Project put up by NOAA. It's a database. It goes back to 1870. And within a few kilometers and a few hundred feet of altitude and a few, up to about an hour or so in time, you can tell uh, exactly what the weather was like at those times. So you can see there's 14 parameters we were measuring. I, I went to the website. There's actually 235 that we'll measure, depending on what you want to look at. But everything from snowfall, wind speed, wind direction, and altitude and surface, 
you can look at dew point, you can look at uh, icing potential, precipitation over the last several hours, uh, lunar illumination, cloud cover at low, medium, and high altitude. Um, what are the other fun things here? Uh, yeah, temperature, wind direction, all that kind of stuff. So you can actually see what kind of environment the pilot was flying through at that time. <coughs> you can also, um, and, and it does correlate very well with the pilot reports we have of the, their terse little statements. It actually matches quite nicely. This is the wind profiles at altitude from the bomb release altitude for uh, 1918 for the American pilots. And you can see here that right when St. EIL kicks off, the wind actually gets worse at altitude at the same time. It's the October weather patterns, or September, October weather patterns you see that's typical for uh, Europe. But I just thought it's interesting that it's relatively easy. Well, the wife was good, but as soon as the battle begins, weather turns against you as well. So they actually had a bit of more of an uphill battle to fight uh, than they would have <coughs> given them credit for. And then, uh, I think we've already covered much of this, that we would go deep into enemy territory. We could shut down the enemy's ability to uh, move forces to reinforce the battlefield. And uh, that movement of battlefield forces, movement of reinforcements, had been the key of a German and Austrian defense strategy. So all of a sudden, losing the ability to move troops by rail severely impacted their ability uh, in 1918 to be able to uh, move their defenses and, and resist the uh, Allied onslaught. And then the last thing I want to mention, this is one of those things you find that are cool. This is the, the uh, town of Koblenz. You can see the, the works here in, in the uh, battlefield, uh, the former battlefield. This is taken in 10 January 1919. Uh, the 91st Aero Squadron was having a ceremony that day for all of its pilots that received the Distinguished Service Clause. And uh, they had a square lined up. There's actually, the official photo actually has all the airplanes in the full square. It actually goes below where this one was shot. They shot a bunch of, air, bunch of photographs. I found this one which is not the official one, and I think it's a better one for it. Um, these are D, uh, D7s over here. These are SPADs, I believe, if I got that right. You can actually see there's differences in uniforms. These are German pilots over here, uh, Americans over this way. For when the Germans are standing at attention, the Americans are all slouching. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a band over here with at least two sousaphones. You've got a whole bunch of dignitaries over here, and here's the pilots uh, lining up to receive their distinguished service cross. Here's why I think it's interesting. Um, the person giving them their Distinguished Service Cross that day is Billy Mitchell. He's in town, uh, his last day before he takes the boat back to the United States. And if you look at the posture and everything like that, here's the guy reading the attention to orders and all that kinds of stuff. you got the guy here with the proper with the medals. And I'm going to lay money, that's Billy Mitchell right there. So the idea of being able to take a picture of Billy Mitchell from the air as he's awarding pilots for their valor in the air, I think is a pretty interesting, possibly meta moment uh, of all that put together. And then one other thing is, I think, I haven't had to be able to look, enough to look at, but I think that Bill Mitchell's plane right there, the one that's out on the floor, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. might be there tucked in and next to the hangar. So with that, this is where you can find all the Thor data. I've got it on cards if you don't have to write it down if you don't want to. So help yourself to a card. And with that, I open up to any questions.